All right. So six four is n not dealing with the loans themselves. Um, uh, it is not dealing with repayment of the loans. It's not dealing with the promissory notes. It's not dealing really with anything about individual loans. 6.4 is about how loans are managed by the hundreds or thousands by these lenders, um, how the loans are treated after they're in existence. Because if you remember, when we talked about, when we first started this discussion, we said, you know, these notes are like cash. Does everybody remember that? How we talked about that the other day? We did the math and we, you know, we showed just how much somebody would pay back over the life of the loan to that lender. And we said, you know, this note really is sort of like cash to the lender because it gives them the right to collect money for a very long time. So when you look at the lending market, you have basically two areas of the lending market. And this is just vocabulary. You don't need to understand it on a deep level. I'm just trying to set the scene for you a little bit. But these next two slides are just vocabulary. So make flashcards for yourself if you need to. Maybe one question on the test. It's not a big deal, but there's no reason for you to be confused about this vocabulary. Everything we've talked about up to this point is what we call the primary lending market. So the primary mortgage market or the primary lending market is where you're dealing with loans on an individual level, where Christina goes to Bank of America and wants to borrow money, where Steven sits down with a mortgage broker and fills out a loan application, where Amy pays off her home equity line. All of that is one loan at a time. You're dealing between the borrower and the lender. Does that definition click for everybody? How do we feel about that as a definition, that the primary market is one loan at a time when you're dealing with a borrower and a bank. Are we all good with that definition? Yes. If that's the primary market, then what in the world is this thing called the secondary market? Because the primary market is where the loans get made. The primary market is where the lenders loan money out. The primary market is where the borrowers apply for loans. The primary market is where the loan actually goes to the borrower. So all of that's happening in the primary mortgage market, and it's happening whether you go to a banker or a broker. So then what is the secondary mortgage market? Well, the secondary mortgage market is what the banks do with the loans after they've made them. Because you have to remember, these loans are not quick things. When a bank makes a loan, how long is that loan going to be on their books, so to speak? 30 years. 30 years in a lot of cases. It could be 15, it could be 20, it could easily be 30. So for a very long time, that bank is going to be dealing with that loan. That is called the secondary mortgage market. Everything that happens with that loan after it's been issued, after it's in place, when basically the borrower is just making monthly payments, is called the secondary mortgage market. Here's what's interesting about the secondary mortgage market. Those lenders do not have to sit there and wait 15 or 20 or 30 years to get their money. They, they simply don't have to wait that long. They have to wait that long if they want to get the money from the borrower. But the note has value. Why does the note have value? Because whoever has it is entitled to the what? The interest. The interest? Not just the interest. The total what? The total, the total payment. Mm -hmm. The total payment. I want you to understand that. Whoever is holding the note in their hand is entitled to that monthly payment. I don't care if you borrowed the money from Bank of America. If they hand the note over to SunTrust, who do you now make payments to? SunTrust. 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 SunTrust is entitled to that monthly debt service payment now because they have the note. And the, here's the interesting thing about that, folks. Borrowers have absolutely no control over that. If Bank of America wants to give SunTrust your note, can they do it? Yes. 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 Here's the only thing SunTrust cannot do. SunTrust cannot change the note. Whatever the note says when you took out the loan with Bank of America is what the loan still says when the note's been turned over to SunTrust. So if your payments were $1,500 a month before, guess what? 
will stay the same. There's same. still fifteen hundred dollars. If you had twelve years left on your loan before, guess what? You still have twelve years left. Everybody okay with that? Mm -hmm. Yep. Now, my guess is Bank of America is not going to give that loan to SunTrust. If it has value, and if SunTrust is going to immediately be able to collect those monthly payments, what do you think is going to actually happen for that note to get transferred from Bank of America over to SunTrust? It's sold. sold. It's going to be sold. It's going to be sold. SunTrust and Bank of America are going to have a negotiation and they're going to come up with a number. And that number is going to be whatever they want it to be, completely negotiable. Now, my guess is, just let's just throw some numbers out here. Let's say the note is for $350,000 and it's for the next 30 years, okay? And, you know, let's just say, payments are $1,805 a month. Now, who came to all those terms with the borrower? The primary lender or the secondary lender? Primary. Primary, primary. primary lender. So Bank of America came to all those terms with the borrower. Bank of America signed the note. The borrower signed the note. Everybody good on that so far? Yes. Yes. Along comes SunTrust, and they say, well, we'll buy that from you. And Bank of America says, okay, how much you give us for it? Do you think that number is going to be $350,000? Nope. No. 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 <laughs> what incentive would Bank of America have to do that? They haven't accomplished anything. They loaned out three fifty. dollars They got three fifty dollars back. They're not making any money on that. Everybody with me? Yeah. What do you think might be a number? Just give me a, a, what do you think a number might be that SunTrust might pay for that thing? $400,000. maybe? I, I heard somebody say four hundred. dollars Let's go with that number. $400,000, which seems crazy. Because the borrower only owes you three fifty. The interest. Except the interest. the interest. Does that make sense for everybody now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I've had people say, well, why didn't SunTrust just make the loan themselves? And they will. But this one's a lot easier. Guess what SunTrust never had to do on this loan? Deal with the, the borrower. borrower. Deal with the borrower. Did SunTrust have to order an appraisal on the property? No. 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 Who already did it for them? The buyer. Bank of America. Bank of America. Does SunTrust have to check the buyer's credit? Nope. No. Oh, who already did it for them? Bank of America. Bank of America. Does SunTrust have to set up this person on direct uh, payments? No. No. Who already did it for them? Bank of America. Bank of America. Literally, SunTrust is just like, okay, I'll give you $400,000 and money will start to magically appear in my account. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to collect money if you're in the secondary market but you pay a premium for it. Does that make sense for everybody? Yes. So here's the analogy I like to think of in my head. I can go to the grocery store and I can buy my own ingredients and make my dinner. If I do that, I'm in the primary mortgage market. Mm -hmm. Or I can hire myself a personal chef where all I gotta do is say, I want salmon and steak for dinner and they do the shopping, they do the list, they come to the house, they make the meal and they put it on the table in front of me. But to get it that way, it's going to be more what for me? Money. It's going to be more expensive. I got to pay a premium. Does that make sense for everybody? Because mm -hmm. the chef's got to make some money along the way. That's Are we all clicking on this idea of a primary mortgage market and a secondary mortgage market? Mm -hmm. yeah. So what if that's not SunTrust in the secondary mortgage market? What if that's, let's say, the North Carolina state employees retirement fund could they be a buyer in the second in the secondary market what do y'all think can they only yes. buy one sure. that were with them like no no it doesn't matter here's the thing does the north carolina state employees retirement plan have a shit ton of cash sitting around but that they're taking out of people's paychecks every month yeah. yes. yes they need to invest that money correct Mm -hmm. What's one of the safest investments in the history of our economy, folks? What is the one payment that people will make 
longer than any mortgage. other payment. Mortgage. Their mortgage. Their mortgage payment. Can the state employees retirement system come out and buy a hundred million dollars worth of notes from Bank of America at one time? Yes. yes. Absolutely. And then who will the payments actually be going to? Straight to them. State employees. Exactly. Straight to them. Straight into that retirement plan. How many of you think that is like all of a sudden you're like, whoa. That's why, folks, when there's a mortgage meltdown, it affects so much more than just the housing industry. Because everybody who's got a retirement account, guess what most of that money is invested in? Those mortgage notes. Everybody who's got a pension, guess what most of that money is invested in? Mortgage, mortgage notes. And see, the, the pension holders, the the people who have their retirement accounts, they love this because they don't have to do any of the month or any of the work. All they got to do is now collect money. But of course, now they have the risk. Does that make sense for everybody now? Yeah. What's the huge benefit to Bank of America here? They loaned out $350,000. The very next day, they sold that note for $400,000. They made $50,000 in one what? Day. One, one day. day. And guess what they're going to do with their three fifty dollars now that they got it back? They're going to make another loan. They're going to go find some other sucker, I mean borrower, to borrow <laughs> money from them. They're going to take their $50,000 profit, and they're going to go find somebody else to loan their three fifty two. dollars right? yep. And what are they going to do with that note as soon as they make it? Sell it. Sell, sell that one too, probably to the same people they sold this one to. Do they keep any of them? Very few. Hmm. Very few. Mostly the banks are what we call mortgage originators at this point. Does that terminology make sense now when you hear it that way? The banks originate the loans, but they don't hold them. Now, there are banks, there are banking institutions that do hold their paper, that do keep their notes on their books. For example, one that most people are familiar with in our state, North Carolina State Employees Credit Union. Yeah. For the most part, they hold their own paper. Um, they keep their own notes. Um, but the big banks, yes, SunTrust, Bank of America, Chase, Citibank, pretty much as soon as they issue that loan, they sell it. In some cases, in a lot of cases, they've actually already negotiated to sell it before it even exists. Wow. You go under contract to buy a house, you get pre-qualified with Bank of America. They're in the process of creating your loan, and they're already shopping it around to some pension <laughs> fund to sell it to. Sometimes you will literally be as the buyer, borrower, at the closing table. You will sign the note, promising to pay this money back to Wells Fargo. And three pieces of paper later, it'll be like, oh, your note's already been sold. It's literally in the same packet of papers. They'll never make one single payment. And so don't worry about folks what lenders keep their pay it's just not it's just not material to us it, and it, it it doesn't matter from your purposes what lenders hold their paper i just gave one example so you could understand that some will but most do not steven i was just going to say uh and they may still do this but in the past you have local smaller banks that say they loan they would use that as a selling point we keep here we're right. local, you're local, we know yep. who you are, and we're not selling these. Yep, some will do that. It's a big deal that would draw, you know, local. It is a big deal because here's the thing. If you have a question about your loan, it's nice to be able to go back to the same place you originally what? Yeah. Borrowed yeah. the money. Yep. If somebody has a problem with repayment and their note's been sold to some retirement <laughs> fund, is it going to be hard to get in touch with somebody about the question? Yep. Right. And that is that I guess this would explain the letter I got in the mail. This is now your new lender. Bingo. That's exactly what happened. They just sold the note. How about this? What if Bank of America wasn't even the primary lender? What if they were already a secondary lender? What if I told you that it's very common that all your small banks will pull theirs together as the originators, sell them to somebody like Bank of America, and then Bank of America will pull millions and millions and millions and hundreds of millions of them together and sell them to even bigger entities like retirement plans. Surely, surely things like social security funds wouldn't be tied up in this, would they? Surely not. The United mm -hmm. States federal government can absolutely buy mortgage notes, folks, as a secondary lender. 
Mm. That's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. It is estimated that on any given year, $11 trillion flows through the secondary mortgage market. Just in mortgages being packaged up and sold in bigger and bigger and bigger buckets. And that's why when you try to call, and here's, and here's the interesting thing about this, and it's not going to be tested, but I find it very interesting. The North Carolina State Employees Retirement Fund may end up owning that note. You may be sending your money to them. The thing of it is, they don't want to deal with you. The whole reason they bought this note is they didn't want, they didn't want to deal with the borrower in the first place. That makes sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. Not only are they going to buy the note from Bank of America, they're going to pay Bank of America monthly to service the note. They're going to tell Bank of America, don't stop taking their payments. You continue to take their payments. And you can skim a little off the top before you send the payment to us. Not only will we buy the note from you for $400,000, but every month you keep making the payments. Here, the, I want you to think about how complex that gets really fast, folks. The borrower has a problem with their loan. Who do they call? The people they're making the payments to, correct? Yes. Correct. But here's the problem with that. The people you're making the payments to are not even the people that you what? Make that you owe anymore. No. Yeah. You owe the money now to the North Carolina State Employees Retirement Fund. And you're talking to somebody at Bank of America. They can't answer your questions. It makes it very complex. And that's why it gets so complex when we get into foreclosures and short sales and all those things. Because there's so many layers of the money being separated from the original borrower and the original lender. Now, there are lots of different buyers in the secondary mortgage market. We only talk about two in this class. I do not want you to think these are the only two, but these are by far the biggest two. And they both have something in common. They both can draw funds from the United States Treasury. The biggest source of money flowing into the secondary mortgage market is money that can be drawn directly from. So another way of saying that is most people end up owing money in one way or another back to who? The federal government. The federal government, because they are ultimately the purchasers of so many of these notes. Okay. So we, that's where we talk about the Federal National Mortgage Association, which is abbreviated FNMA. How many of you have ever heard of Fannie Mae before? You ever heard that, that expression used on the news or something like that? Some of you may have not. Um, it is very dated at this point in time. When the organization was created and people saw FNMA like that, the Federal National Mortgage Association, apparently... It was all the rage at that point in time that your name was Fannie Mae because people say, like, "Oh, we we'll just call it Fannie Mae." Okay, but nobody's somebody, named nobody's named Fannie Mae anymore. Except yeah, somebody in our last class said they remember this by Freak the Main Man or something. I don't know. Yeah, that, that's. Didn't the government have to bail out Fannie Mae or in, in the? Well, that's and that's an interesting point, Janet. What do we say? Both of these buyers have in common. They oh, can the both draw money directly from where. Government. The government. I'm the government. Now, Fannie Mae is a private company. You can buy stock in Fannie Mae. Matter of fact, that's how you can own mortgage notes, too. You can be a buyer of mortgage notes, but you probably don't have the cash to buy the, lo the notes in total. You probably don't have five hundred dollars or $600,000 to go out and buy a note. You probably got $5,000. So how do you buy notes? You invest in a company that's going to take your money and do what? And buy, and buy notes. That company is Fannie Mae. Mm -hmm. If you want to bet, if you want to bet on the mortgage market, you invest your money in the Federal National Mortgage Association. The interesting thing about Fannie Mae is, and this gets to your Janet, uh, your question, Janet, is Fannie Mae is set up specifically to prevent the mortgage market from com completely collapsing in the way it did during the Great Depression. The mortgage market completely collapsed during the Great Depression. Remember when I mentioned to you all that all the lenders accelerated all the notes all at one time, right? Mm -hmm. yes. And that caused just millions of foreclosures rippling across the country. And basically, uh, lenders wouldn't make loans. They just wouldn't make loans at all. And it froze everything about the economy. And that's why the Depression was so bad and so long. Fannie Mae was created 
as a response to that. He said, okay, let's create a private company. They're there to make money, just like any other private company. Here's the difference. They can automatically be bailed out by the federal government. If Fannie Mae gets in trouble, if mortgages start to fail, if Fannie Mae starts to lose money, they can continue to still buy those notes by simply going to who and saying, we need more money right now. The federal government. Federal government. So Fannie Mae can go at any time to the U.S. Treasury and basically get an unlimited credit line directly from the U.S. Treasury. Now, it does have to be paid back. I think sometimes people hear this and are like, man, that's a, uh, that's a scam right there. Here's the interesting thing about Fannie Mae. Fannie Mae did borrow a lot of money from the federal government in 2008, 2009, 2010 so that they could continue to purchase mortgages in the secondary market. Because think about it. If they stopped purchasing, what would the banks have stopped doing? Lending. Even loans. Lending. You would have literally gone to the bank. The bank said, we ain't got no money because we can't sell your mortgage, right? Mm -hmm. So Fannie Mae continued to buy, but Fannie Mae was broke because mortgages were failing. So where did they get the money to continue to buy from? Federal government. Federal, federal government. government. They borrowed about $4 trillion from the federal government over the course of three years. Every penny repaid plus interest at this point in time. Really? Every single penny plus interest repaid at this point in time. Somebody in 1945 was damn smart because the system they created functioned exactly as it was intended to in this case. It doesn't happen very often, so we should applaud it when it does happen. <laughs> but Fannie Mae did its job. It prevented the mortgage market from completely collapsing. And yeah, it is a bailout of sorts, but it's a designed bailout. They were basically designed not to fail. Does that make sense for everybody when I say it that way? Mm -hmm. okay. That's good. Positive. And so... Fannie Mae pays the money back. Jenny Mae, or the Government National Mortgage Association, never pays the money back. If they lose, they just lost the government's money. This one is charity. That's all it is. This one is charity. So the question is, why does the government have charity for mortgages? It is because the government wants to make sure that certain ones get made. What kinds of loans have we talked about? In fact, we have a particular name for them where the government is saying, you know what? We know that conventional lenders have told you you're too risky and you can't get a loan, but we think you should have a loan anyway. Government back. Government back loans. What kind of loans do you think Jenny May that buys? FHA, FHA, VA, USDA loans. Now, most of the time, those loans don't lose money. And if they don't lose money, then Jenny Mae makes money, means the government makes money. But if they do lose money, who's the loss on? The government. The, the government. government, straight up. That's why they are called what? Government backed. Government, government backed back. loans. They don't lose, we lose. Look well, that. ultimately, right. The government is the taxpayers, for sure. That's exactly right. But that is, I just wanted you to understand the terminology. Is that terminology government backed making a little bit more sense now? Because yeah. basically the government is funding the company that's buying the loans. And if the company takes a loss, then the government just funds the loss. Now, in most circumstances, the company doesn't take a loss. Most years, Jenny Mae makes money, which is good for the federal government. But when it does lose money, it loses a lot. And mm -hmm. that is a direct bailout by the federal government that doesn't have to be paid back. Fannie Mae, because it's a private company, that money. So what loans do you think Fannie Mae mostly buys? Conventional. Conventional loans. There you go. See how hard was that? Fannie Mae buys the less risky ones, the conventional ones, and Jenny Mae comes along and buys the garbage. I, I have used the analogy before. Fannie Mae is the prom queen. Jenny May is the one who will go with anybody. Sorry. I mean, just the way it is. <laughs> Jenny ain't pit she ain't pitches. She's in somebody's car in the parking lot right now. Oh, poor Jenny. She, she, she's a good time, but she ain't She'll learn. You know. Will she though? I don't know. She's been around for 70, 80 years. She ain't learned yet. Uh, She'll uh, learn. <laughs> but everybody likes her. She's popular. 
Because would those FHA, VA, USDA loans get made if there wasn't somewhere for those lenders to sell them? Nope. No. They would not. They would not. And that's where the terminology government-backed loans come from. Now, we mentioned the other day, but I'm bears mentioning again, what a <laughs> subprime loan is. A subprime loan is just a loan made to borrowers that are higher risk. Borrowers who don't qualify for mostly what kind of loan lending, either conventional or government backed, right? Yep. Borrowers who are outside of normal qualification sort of rules can still get loans, but they are very risky loans. And that was one of the main problems with our lending practices in the early 2000s. I mean, there was pretty much the perception out there, and it was a real perception that if you had a pulse, you could get not only one loan, but two or three and go out and buy investment properties. And I mean, you know, it, it was not uncommon for people who had never owned a single property to graduate high school and all of a sudden, just because they called themselves a real estate investor, own six properties that they had all financed with 100% loan to value loans. That's pretty dangerous, folks. That's pretty risky, and it did not work well. It ultimately did not work well because those loans failed at a very high rate. Um, and when, here's what you need to understand about foreclosures. It's sort of like a sickness that spreads. Does one foreclosure in a neighborhood have an impact on the value of other properties in that neighborhood? Yes, it does. Of course it does. Does three foreclosures in that neighborhood have an impact on the value of property in that neighborhood. Most definitely. Does 10 foreclosures on the same street have an impact on the other property value in that neighborhood? Yeah. Yeah. And that's what happened in 2007, 2008. It wasn't just the subprime borrowers that got in trouble, folks. Everybody got in trouble because they watched the value of the real estate that they had pledged as collateral do what overnight because of the foreclosures. Tank. It just bottomed out. It tanked. And so you had borrowers that had put 20% down. I want you to imagine this now. You bought a $500,000 house. You put 20% down. So you only borrowed 400000 You were one of the not risky ones. Everybody with me so far? Mm -hmm. Yeah except 10 houses on your street were the risky ones and they all failed and they all went to foreclosure and they've all now sold for three hundred and twenty-five, three hundred and fifty thousand dollars meanwhile you're sitting here you paid 500 you borrowed 400 aren't you all aren't you now upside down on the property even though you put a hundred thousand dollars cash down as equity mm -hmm. yeah so people who were supposedly safe borrowers all of a sudden were like well, the hell with this. I'm not going to keep making payments on something that I'm $100,000 upside down on. I already lost my money. And you won't say I'm $100,000 upside down. Mm -mm. And they just walked away. They just walked away. Which, of course, led to even more foreclosures. And that put even more people in what? Foreclosure. In foreclosure. In the danger of foreclosure. It was the most spiral out of control thing you can possibly imagine. Some of you may remember it because you were around, but it was another thing entirely to be on the inside of it and watch it. It was very painful to have discussions with somebody and who wanted to sell their house and say to them, well, I think we can sell your house for about $350,000. And they would say, but I owe four twenty-five. dollars And we would say, that's not going to change what it would sell for. And they were like, well, how's that going to work? I'm like, do you have $75,000? For what? Folks, if you owe four twenty-five, dollars don't you owe four twenty-five? dollars Yep. Even if the property's only valued at what? Three. $350. $350. You're going to have to pay the difference. And if you can't pay the difference, the only other option is foreclosure. And even then, you're probably going to have a deficiency and they're going to come after you for a deficiency judgment. And it just spiraled. It just, and it got worse and worse and worse and worse. That's what happens when the mortgage market is not smart in the way they lend. And that's why the Dodd-Frank Act came along. The Dodd-Frank Act was designed to make loans more transparent. One of the, the thought process was this. A lot of borrowers, and in my experience, this was true to some extent. I won't say it was the only reason, but it was certainly a reason. 
It, it was the big thought that a lot of borrowers simply didn't understand the loans they had. They simply didn't understand what it meant that that rate was adjustable and that it could change by so much and that the payment could go up by so much. They just didn't have an idea of what would happen if the value of the property dropped a little bit and that they wouldn't be able to refinance and they wouldn't be able to do those things. And so the Dodd-Frank Act seeks to simply make lending more borrower friendly, more consumer friendly, more transparent. And I think that's a noble goal. Now we can debate whether it's actually had that impact. I think in some ways it has, but that's the, that is the idea of what the Dodd-Frank Act and the, the bureau that was created by the Dodd-Frank Act called the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau. This Consumer Finance Protection Bureau was designed to, and as you, their logo points out, shed light on the loans that were being issued. And that means giving more disclosures, more information to the borrower, making sure the borrower is more aware of what they were getting into and what they were paying for. And so one facet of the uh, Consumer Finance Protection Bureau is they regulate a law called Regulation X of the Truth in Lending Act, better known as RESPA. You need to know the name of that law, you need to know what it stands for, and we're going to talk about what it does. RESPA stands for the Real Estate, that's easy, R-E, Real Estate, Settlement. Settlement. What do you think settlement is another word for? What do we more commonly call settlement? Closing. Closing, right? Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act. The name tells you what it does. It is a law that regulates how what day happens. Closing day. Closing. The day of closing. It is a law all about the day of closing. Everything about RESPA is about what happens on the day of closing, the day that borrower borrows the money, and how they are given the information about that loan leading up to closing. That's the whole purpose of RESPA. So the Real Estate Settlement Procedures, Procedures Act governs closing a loan. Now notice I just said closing a what? Loan. A loan. Are there going to be some transactions, and I guarantee it's going to be a test question. Are there going to be some transactions that are exempt from RESPA, even though it's a federal law? Yes. Yes. Cash. Cash. Yes. Cash. Cash. Mm -hmm. Because in a cash transaction, there is no loan involved. Does that make sense for everybody? Mm -hmm. Yep. So RESPA and the rules of RESPA only apply. So all of these things that we're about to talk about, you have to do this, you have to do that, you have to do this. Those don't apply in what kind of transactions? Cash. Cash. If we tell you you have to put, you have to have a closing statement, a closing disclosure according to RESPA, well, that means you have to have one in every transaction that involves a what? Loan. A loan. Mm -hmm. But you are not required to have one in a transaction that is. Cash. 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 Because this is only based on regulating loans. It's not meant to regulate real estate transactions. It's meant to regulate the loans used in real estate transactions. Does that help when I say it that way? Okay. Did the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau establish Regulation X? No, Regulation X was a law that was already in place, but it largely didn't have anybody to enforce it. Nobody was okay. paying attention. It was so like think of it this way. We talk about the speed limit a lot, right? If if the road had a speed limit on it, but you knew for a fact that there were no law enforcement officers within 100 miles and they had never been there in the last 20 years, would anybody follow the speed limit? Nope. No. And that was the problem with Regulation X and RESPA prior to the Dodd-Frank Act and the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau. It was like, well, we have this law, but nobody's following it. And everybody in the financial services industry said, well, nobody follows it because y'all don't enforce the damn thing. Mm -hmm. Nobody's checking. Nobody's making sure that we're following this rule. So the point of the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau was to actually come along and enforce Regulation X. Does that help, okay. Seth? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so the law was there first, then the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau comes along and says, okay, now we're the police for this law. Um, so it doesn't apply to commercial, it doesn't apply to cash. Um, Rebecca said, can I, uh, 
explain federally related. I can, but I'm going to do it by backing up. These two companies, Fannie Mae and Jenny Mae, both ultimately can get money from where? Government. Government. The government. So any loan being purchased by either Fannie Mae or Jenny Mae falls under the scope of RESPA because eventually the money may be coming from where to buy that loan? Government. From the government. Does that make sense? Is it that help? commercial too or just residential? Just residential. Just residential. Does that help, Rebecca? Right. So any loan that's being sold to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac or Jenny Mae or any of those is a federally related loan. For your purposes, you don't have to worry about the federally related part. Because Fannie Mae and Jenny Mae buy most of them, if there's a loan involved, RESPA is going to be involved. It's just a loan. Okay. Um, now, one of the first requirements of RESPA, because remember, it's all about transparency is that a borrower must receive something called a loan estimate when they apply for their loan. Are most borrowers applying for the loan after they're already under contract on a property or is this something that's happening way earlier than that for most borrowers? Way earlier. Before. before. Way before. As a matter of fact, isn't the first thing we're, remember how we talked about the other day? What's one of the first pieces of advice we're gonna give to our buyer clients? You need to get what? Pre-qualified. 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 Well, guess what you got to fill out to get pre-qualified, folks? A loan application. A loan application. That's the only way you get pre-qualified is to fill out an application. That is a loan application. And RESPA says that when somebody fills out a loan application, that lender is now on the clock. They must tell that borrower one of two things. Either you're denied or you're approved. And if they say you're approved, they have to give them an estimate of what that loan is that they're approved for, what it would look like, what is the month. How many of y'all think that's pretty damn fair? If you're going to tell somebody you're approved, now we need to tell you what your monthly payment's going to be. We need to tell you what your interest rate's going to be. We need to tell you what fees you're going to have to pay, like origination fees and discount points. Doesn't that seem pretty realistic at that point in time? Yeah. We don't even put an offer in until we see that, so we really know. Absolutely. Like, Janet just said, why would you even think about putting an offer in until you've seen this? Because you don't know that the borrower is going to be comfortable with these numbers, correct? Mm -hmm. Listen, I've had plenty of people that go put the loan application in, and the borrower and the, the lender will give them like an instant, you know, like on the computer. You're pre-qualified for up to $425,000. And they tell me, okay, we want to look at four twenty five. dollars and then the next day, they get this loan estimate. And they're like, shit, no, I can't afford that monthly payment. What are they? That, that? And that's why they need it. Does that make sense for everybody? This gives them what that loan would look like if they actually decide to go through with it. Notice I said they might not get that loan estimate till the next day. It's technically supposed to be given when you apply. But there's a deadline. You need to know that deadline for test taking purposes. What is the deadline for the lender to give this borrower their loan estimate after they have taken that borrower's loan application? Three banking days. Three, days. Three, banking days. Three banking days. And the reason it's banking days is because we're dealing with what? Money. Money. Anytime we deal with money, we switch to banking days. Any other time in the class, when we talk about three days or five days or 10 days, it's calendar days. But when we're talking about money, it becomes banking days because banking days are very different than calendar days with holidays and all that sort of stuff worked in there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so three banking days. What's the deadline again after the buyer or borrower applies for this loan? No later than three banking days. No later than ideally when should the lender give it to them? Right, 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 away. right, right away. As soon as they say you're approved, they should be given them the statement, but no later than three banking days. After the that, day that you apply, is that the first day or the next day is the first day? You always count the next day as the first day. When you say three days, you always start on the day after. So it's a great point right now. If you fill out a loan application today, when's day one? Monday. Monday. Yeah. Because it's banking Monday. day, right? So if somebody fills out a loan application today, 
when does the lender, what's the deadline for them to provide that loan estimate to that borrower by? No later Wednesday. than what? Wednesday. Wednesday. Later than Wednesday of next week. Is everybody okay with that? Mm-hmm. Does Monday be day one, Tuesday be day two, Wednesday be day three? Yes. If the borrower applies with 15 different lenders, how many of these loan estimates are they going to get? 15. 15. 15. Here, in my opinion, is one of the most useful parts of the law. Prior to the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, lenders could choose whatever form they wanted to use to give this information on. And they all had different paperwork. It made it impossible for borrowers to really compare one lender to the other. If you had a 26 page document from this lender and a two page document from this lender and it was on page 12 with this lender and on page 14 with this lender and on page one with this lender, are most Americans equipped to deal with trying to find all that, hunt for it and compare it between the lenders? No. No. So one of the things that Consumer Finance Protection Bureau enforced, and this has been a big change in our industry, what you are seeing on the screen right here is what a loan estimate looks like from any lender in the United States of America for any mortgage note. They are required to use the same piece of paper. What does that allow the borrower to do if they want to shop around? Side by side. Side by side. Can they put 10 loans side by side and say, you know what? The interest rate On this one is this and this and that. Can they look at the interest rate across the board on every single one of them and find an exact same place? Yes. Yes. Can they look at their monthly payment right here and uh, compare across the board? If I do this loan with this lender, I'm paying this, 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 and this. Mm -hmm. Y'all think? Yeah. And probably equally importantly to monthly payment, because I think this gets uh, lost in the shuffle sometimes. I want you to see this number right down here, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to zoom it up for you because I think it's worth doing that if I can. There we go. Closing cost. Is that a big number that could vary a lot lender to lender? Yeah. Yes. yes. Absolutely. So shopping around make a big difference here. I've seen some of these where you see my, one might be $8,000 to close and one might be $2,000 to close. Wow. Now, the payment might be different, but if the payment's only $15 a month difference and one's got $8,000 in closing costs, the other got $2,000, which one do you think the borrower's going to choose? The smaller closing costs. The, the one with the lower closing costs. Prior to this being on a form where you could compare them side by side, which one do you think they would have chosen? The one with the smaller payment. The one with the smaller Mm -hmm. payment. And that's exactly why this law exists, folks. Because it's designed to empower the borrower to be able to shop around. That's the whole purpose. I'm sorry. I'm I'm assuming this isn't required for brokers to mention to their clients because, like, I know our mortgage broker didn't say anything about it. I think Janet also said the same thing. Like, they didn't tell tell her to shop around. You, are you asking if we're required to mention this? Yeah, like why Let me ask you, the same person? Old, <laughs> don't we owe our clients old car? Yeah, so that's is, why. Like, is advice included in old car? Yeah, so why wouldn't they? Would it have been useful advice for your real estate broker to say to you, it's in your best interest to shop the loan around so you can make a wise decision? Yeah, so why wouldn't they? They didn't do their job. Okay. Or they have a, my guy liked his guy, so. Well, for whatever the rationale and the reason was, they didn't do their job. Okay. They, and so I want you to learn from that experience. I don't want you to, you know, yeah, it's okay you to know, feel some yeah. kind of way about that grudge, <laughs> but don't repeat that for your own clients. What's going to be the first advice you give your own clients? You shop around. Shop around. Absolutely. Remember what I told you. They also have the ability to shop around. How how long of a period of time do they have after they fill out the first application? 30 days. 30 days that it's not going to count against their credit anymore. So now they really need to do what? Shop around. Shop it around. When you send a recommendation for a lender, should you send them one or should you send them four or five and say, hey, get pre-qualified with all of them? If you've got somebody else you want to try, get pre-qualified with them. And once you get these loan estimates back, let's sit down and take a look at what? At all the applications. At all of them. All the loan estimates. Side by side. So we can figure out what's going to be the best route for you. I'm going to do that. Okay. Uh, Natalie? 
Um, Travis, um, just to make sure I got it, um, when it says, when you said that if you applied today, uh, the clock would start, the three banking days would start on Monday. So if Monday is a federal holiday, would it start Tuesday? Correct. Banking days don't count federal holidays. That's exactly right. Exactly right. Okay. So let's take a look a little bit deeper in RESPA. That's the first requirement. That's just the first requirement of RESPA. That loan estimate to tell, it's just like taking your car into a shop. Before you say, yes, I want you to fix my car. Before you commit anything, what do you want them to give you? An estimate. An, an estimate. estimate. An estimate. Same idea here. Before you commit to using this lender, you want to see an estimate of everything. And, and the whole purpose is the shopping around. That's the idea. Look at what's on the screen now. This looks suspiciously the same as what we were just looking at. Doesn't it, doesn't it look awfully familiar? Yeah, it looks like the loan estimate. It looks exactly like the loan estimate, does it not? Mm -hmm. Guess what? It ain't. But it is on the exact same form. Look at what this one is called. A closing disclosure. If the loan estimate was supposed to come at the beginning of the process, when do you think RESPA requires this document to come? Closing. At the end. At the Hi. end of the process, also known <laughs> as closing. That's why it's called a closing disclosure. Why two documents? I want you to think about the analogy with your car. When you go drop your car off and you get an estimate, they probably give you an estimate. Sometimes they even get you to sign off on the estimate that you're okay with those charges, right? The estimate and then it'll be the actual charges. Actual. And then when you come back, they give you a statement that shows the what? Actual, actual the charges. actual charges and those of you that are smart shoppers don't you pull that estimate back out and put it side by side and say make sure they yeah. charge me what they said they were going to charge me yes yep, and if anything's different don't you gonna wait just a minute now hold on hold on yep hold hold right back up why why is this number different that's exactly why this law exists folks this did not happen prior to 2007 2008 it simply didn't happen. Borrowers often showed up to closing having no idea what kind of closing costs they were going to be expected to pay that day. That's crazy. None. No idea. Will the year be on the test? Like, will it ask us when this came out? No, it won't ask you about the year it's passed. Just make sure you know the specifics of the law and what it requires. So, if the first document, the loan estimate, is required to be delivered no later than three banking days after they apply. When do you think this one has to be delivered? At least three days before, before, before closing. closing. Three banking days, not after, but what? Before. Before closing. Wouldn't this be useless if we gave, brought it after closing? Yeah. Of I mean, they've already paid for it at that point, right? They've already paid for it. The idea here is to get it to them three banking days before closing so they have time to put them what? Um, side computer. by side. Yeah. They have time to go back to that estimate and now look at the closing disclosure. And guess who's also going to be looking at it side by side with them if you're doing your job? Yes. Your real estate broker is going to say, okay, you got your closing disclosure. In fact, a good real estate broker a really good one would have already had that conversation with the lender and said what when you send my client their closing disclosure you also what send it to me send it to me, send it to me. you send it to me even if you got to get your client's permission because some of them will be assholes about that and we can't do that that's the clients that's the borrowers personal information all right asshole i'll fix that do i you know what i do i send them an email and i copy my client dear john Per our conversation earlier today, I am writing to inform you that my client wishes you to send me everything associated with their loan documentation, including the closing disclosure. They are copied on this email. If you have any questions, please consult with them. But absolutely every document associated with this loan gets copied to me. How many of you think that's doing my job as somebody who's supposed to protect them? Yeah. Yeah, my agent never did this stuff. Because I see hundreds of these. I am much more likely to be able to spot something that's out of the ordinary just because of repetition. 
if no other reason, right? And so this is, a, to me, a huge, I take it, I, hopefully that comes across, I take this very seriously. It's a huge part of the job. I wouldn't tell you how many times you just find just outright mistakes. You know, the estimate shows the origination fee is this, and you get to the closing disclosure, and it's a completely different number. And you're like, whoa, whoa. why? What happened? So there's a reason for this. Everybody good with that? Yep. Okay. Now, if we don't get it, we can't close by federal law. If it doesn't come in time. So I want you to work backwards. Let's say our closing is scheduled for Tuesday of next week. If we don't have the closing disclosure right now, are we closing on Tuesday of next week? No. No. Cancel closing. Ain't nobody closing Tuesday of next week because we don't have what? The closing disclosure. The closing disclosure. What's the earliest we can close right now, assuming they get it to us today? Wednesday. 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 Oh, right. Sorry. Wednesday of next week. That's the earliest we can close. And that's if they get it to us today. You're on the clock. Okay, so make sure you understand how this impacts, how this law and the way it plays out impacts the, the transaction. The other thing I want to point out to you on this, and this is something we're going to talk about later in the class for sure. The other thing I want to point out to you about this, which I think is a super important thing for you to understand, but also for you to be able to explain to your bar. I want you to look at that bottom number down there. That's different than closing costs. Does that make does that, does everybody see the number I'm pointing to? The uh, the 14,147.26? Yep. That is the total amount of money this buyer is expected to bring to the closing with them. What does that also include? What's included in that number if it's the total amount of money we bring, expect them to bring? The down payment. Their down payment's cost. also in there. The closing costs are in there. Every penny of what they're expected to pay is in there. If they got to pay commissions, is that included in that number? No. Uh, yes. 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 The whole point is what's included in that? All Everything. Oh. Everything. Every penny. It is a violation of federal law to ask them to bring one penny more than that when they go to closing. And that... That's not, that's different than like if they have anything in escrow or no, no. It is not different. This okay. includes whatever they've already put down. So what's included in here, if they've already put a $20,000 earnest money deposit, that's already been factored into this number. Got it. This is an all-inclusive number. This buyer better bring a certified check or wire transfer for $14,147.26 when they come to that closing. That's out the door. Everybody okay on that number? Mm -hmm. It is meant to be, which is exactly what the borrower needs. They need an all-inclusive number. They don't need, oh, you need twelve thousand for this, and you need thirteen hundred dollars for this, and twenty-six hundred dollars for that, and right. Um, so uh, Heather said, "Is commission included in closing costs or in the cash to close line?" Heather, everything is included in the cash to close line. The cash to close line, you shouldn't have to ask, "Is is something included in that?" everything's included in that. Now, your question about are commissions included in closing costs? Yes, they generally are. But the cash to close line, let me be clear, includes what, folks? Everything. 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 Shirley, you had your hand up. I always got to remember to unmute myself. Yep. So when uh, does RESPA also regulate the closing disclosures <laughs> on the seller's side. Uh, RESPA does not regulate a closing disclosure on the seller's side. That's a great question because the seller is not obtaining a what? A loan. A loan. A loan. So is there, a, is there someone else that regulates a disclosure for closing on the seller's side? Yes, the seller. Okay. The seller. It's called the seller? No, the seller themselves. There is no law about telling a seller anything at closing. Okay. At all. The only people who are covered, and that's why I love the question that you ask, because who protects the seller at closing? The, the, the seller? The seller themselves, or hopefully who? Their, their broker. Their, their real estate yeah. broker. Do you think yeah. we, have a, we have a big responsibility on the seller side too, now that you know that the seller's not going to get this thing? 
Mm-hmm. Seller's not obligated to get this. Who's obligated to get this? And that's going to be a test question too, by the way. Who's obligated to get this? The buyer. The buyer. Just the buyer borrower. That's it. They're mm-hmm. the only one. We might give the seller, the seller one out of the goodness of our hearts, but it's not required. Gotcha. And some closing attorneys won't. Some closing attorneys will look at the seller and go, I'm sorry, you don't get one. Mm-hmm. And there's no way to force them to because there's no law that says they have to. Only the borrower. Good, really good question. Thank really you. good question. Yep, absolutely. Okay. So this thing then goes into detail. I, I like to think of the the first page as the big picture page. And then the next two pages are the detail pages. Look, I mean, look over here. This details every single one of those closing costs, right? And so if you if you were to zoom in on here, you can look and see, like for as an example some of the things that would count as closing costs that are being charged to that buyer. Are they being charged, for example, an origination fee? What do you think? Yes. Y'all see it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Line, line A1 up there? Mm-hmm. Yeah, 0.25%. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I love line A2. Application you know that application you filled out three months ago. <laughs> we're we're now charged. We're now charging you three hundred dollars for for processing that application for you. Congratulations. Was free. No. I, I love I love line A three as well. Underwriting fee. It's called paperwork, folks. That's the paperwork fee. They're charging one thousand ninety seven dollars for processing the paperwork. You can't negotiate yeah. any of these down, can you? Well, you can, but not at this point. When can you negotiate these things? When you get the what? Estimate. 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 When you get the loan estimate. That's exactly right. Mm-hmm. That's one of the, the nice things about the loan estimate. Because can you compare these fees among the lenders and then play them off of each other? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. I do that all the time. Lenders have a love-hate relationship with me. Mm-hmm. They love me because they want my clients. And they know I'm going to be straightforward and they know I'm going to be easy to work with once we get under contract. But they hate me because I whittle them down like no to bar on these things. I will, on behalf of my client, I'll be like, wait a minute now, why are you charging a thousand dollar origination fee? Wells Fargo's only charging 500. And I will send that lender Wells Fargo's loan estimate. Prove it. We can do that? Absolutely, you can do it as long as your client says you can. Okay. Absolutely. Probably, right? Like they're, they expect it of savvy buyers. Or- the savvy buyers expect it and savvy lenders also expect it too. Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah. The lenders who have clients who are unrepresented by a real estate broker or the real estate broker doesn't fight for them, they look at you and call you a sucker because they have padded these fees in a lot of cases, folks. This is all cash to them. It's all profit to them, these fees. They're very negotiable at the time of loan application. Natalie, you had your hand up. Um, Travis, so since our clients can shop around and apply with different lenders, let's say they apply with five different lenders, are they gonna pay the application fee and underwriting fee for all five? Well, they're not gonna pay an underwriting fee because they're not taking out five loans. Underwriting is the process of actually completing the loan. They may pay an application fee. You'll have to check with the different lenders. That's, uh, you know, that, that's the, if it's a fee for applying, my guess is yes, they will. But you'd have to see what that application fee is. And, you know, again, but still my recommendation would be apply for multiple loans. Apply for multiple loans. Okay. So that that is, to me, page one is like the big picture. And then page two and three gives you all the detailed breakdown. It tells you, for example, how we came up with that $14,000 that somebody needs to bring to closing right there. You know, it says, this is how we came up with it. Now, if you will notice, and I'll go and and zoom in on the other side just so you can see it, this does have a seller's side. It's not on there for the seller. Who gets this document? The buyer. The The buyer does. Why does the buyer need to see the seller's numbers? What do you think? Just make sure they're correct. Well, yes and no. What would affect the buyer more than anything else about this? Commission overpaying. Not commission. The debt. Money owed. Yes. Debt. 
any liens yeah. against that property. Uh, Don't we need to see that the liens are being satisfied on this thing? Yeah. Y'all don't forgot about Danielle's mom going to the uh, mm -hmm. right. Ex exactly. <laughs> you forgot that story. So when you look at this, can we see that this seller is paying off their mortgage note? Yes. 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 They're paying a hundred thousand dollars to pay off their mortgage note. That would be important for the buyer to know, because remember, if that doesn't get paid off, that lien stays what, folks? To the property. Attached to the property. Attached right? to the property. So you got to be looking for, so would a good real estate broker representing a buyer be aware of the liens that are on the property and then have like a checklist when you get this thing before closing and go down the checklist and be like, yep, there's that one, there's that one, there's that one, and make sure they're all being satisfied. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Got it. Job got bigger, didn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why we get paid the big bucks. See, everybody thinks it's for opening doors. It ain't. It's for, it's for this. Oops, sorry. I didn't mean to stop the share. It's for this kind of stuff. I mean, really, though, it is. This is the kind of stuff that we get paid for. I'm um, sorry. I didn't mean to stop the share. Let me put that back. Okay. So make sure you understand the relationship between the loan estimate and then later on the closing disclosure. Are we all good on the timing of those two and the relationship? Okay. Oh, Brian just asked a great question in the in the chat. I'm gonna zoom in on it again. Brian just asked a great question in the chat. He said, "Is this number over here?" Oh, my zoom's not working all of a sudden. Is this number over here the seller's equity? What do y'all think? Yes, the sixty. Yes. Yep. That is the seller's equity, $64,414.96. Because what do we say equity was? It's the amount of cash that you the seller away. would do what? Walk away with. Yeah. Walk away with after they sell this property and pay off all the debts and all the fees and all everything. That's the seller's equity right there, $64,000 and some change. And that's the same as like saying net, right, for them? Right, that's the seller's okay. net. Seller's okay. equity means okay. the same thing means exactly the same thing. They're walking away with 64 grand. Great point. Absolutely. Absolutely. Love it. All right. So now that we've kind of talked about the two documents, let's talk about another part of the Truth in Lending Act. Remember, RESPA is just one part of the Truth in Lending Act. There's another part of the Truth in Lending Act. Uh, and Brian said, what would happen if that was a negative, though? Then the seller would owe money. If that number was a negative, the seller would have to also bring it money. It wouldn't be closing. checked to seller. Yeah, right. It would say cash from safe. seller if it was a negative number. That's an ugly closing. I've been to those closings. That ain't fun. Can you imagine being the seller and having to bring a check to sell your property? Just to sell your property. Ain't fun. It happened a lot in 2009, 2010. You'd see people have to liquidate their retirement account just to sell their house. So did you do mostly sale selling when in those two years or so? I mostly ate ramen noodles and prayed. Oh. <laughs> it was a bad time to be in real estate. Yeah. It was a real bad time. Because not only was it hard to get a transaction done, they were all miserable transactions. Because every seller was in foreclosure or a short sale or had lost a ton of money. So they were all angry and screaming at it, everybody involved all the time. And you it were hard. Again, right? You didn't I'm have, sorry. You didn't have, were you teaching then? That is coincidentally, or maybe not so coincidentally, when I started teaching. Oh, wow. Cool. Some of us started teaching because we needed the money when the market fell apart. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But yes. Um, um, the other part um, of the Alexa, Truth in Lending Act. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Alexa. Yeah, go ahead, Alexa. This might be silly, but. Um, and I know it doesn't have anything to do with a loan, but if, if you're paying, if your buyer is paying in cash, do they get a paper like similar to this with the things from the seller that lets them know that, that they don't have any outstanding And that, that's a great question. Most attorneys use this form whether the buyer is getting a loan or not. There's nothing in the law that says you can't use this form. Since uh -huh. everybody's comfortable with this form, most attorneys will use it even in cash transactions, even though they're not obligated to, for that very reason. Just so, okay. the sell, just so the buyer can see that those liens are being satisfied and those kinds of things. Yeah. Okay. Closing attorneys make 
drawing this up with the information from the lender. Yes, that is correct. The closing okay. attorneys are creating the closing disclosure, but based on information they get from who? Who are they working with to compile these numbers? The lender. The lender. The lender. Right. Yeah. The lender is. And the reason the closing attorney is doing it is because the closing attorney is dealing with the stuff on both sides, the seller side and the buyer side. The lender is only seeing the buyer's side of the transaction. The closing attorney is the one seeing, OK, we got to satisfy this lien. We got to pay this expense. We got to do this. So they have access to all of the information. So they're the ones that create it. Once they've created it, they send it to the lender and say, is this what you want? And the lender says, hey, that's what I want. And then the lender releases it to the borrower at least three banking days before closing. And by the way, if the borrower finds a mistake and it requires a change in that document, they have to generate a new one. And that guess what that does to the clock, folks? Three more days. Resets the clock again. When they send that thing back out with a correction on it, three more banking days. So it's it's less a big than that, right? It can be less than that than three days. It, it cannot, for your purposes on this test, no, it cannot be. Is there a process by which everybody can waive it? And yes, theoretically, but for your purposes, it, three yeah. banking days. Yeah. Okay. Um, Nato said, "Can a closing attorney say no to giving it to a seller if they request it?" They absolutely can, because closing attorneys generally, folks, do not represent sellers. Who hires? Who chooses? Who gets representation from the closing attorney at closing? Lender. Not the lender. Lender doesn't choose them. Lender works with them, but they don't choose them. The buyer. The buyer. The buyer. The buyer. Closing attorneys represent buyers in this state. They're chosen by buyers. They're hired by buyers. So it, they are looking out for the buyer. They can pick and choose what they give to the seller. And so sometimes sellers who are not satisfied that they're not getting enough information could a seller engage representation of their own, just like anything else? Could the seller go and get their own closing attorney to work with the buyer's closing attorney, and now you have two closing attorneys on the deal? What do you think? Yes. Absolutely. They don't do it very often because it's an additional expense, but they don't, but they could. Do you ever allow your clients to shop around closing attorneys or do you just really suggest whomever you, you like? So when it comes to closing attorneys, I ask them, do you have an attorney that you have a close relationship with already? Do you have somebody who's done your wills, who's done your estate work, who's done, you know, personal law for you? Maybe you have somebody who's done family law for you. Do you have anybody that you have a, a relationship with already? Because that would be my first preference in any closing is to use an attorney that they already have a relationship with. I mean, think about it. You already have built up that relationship. You already have your personal information. There's, you're not sharing their social security number and date of birth with somebody who doesn't already have it. So to me, that's the first preference. If they say yes, then I say, okay, well, who is that? And do you want them to handle this for you as well? Since they're already your attorney in other matters, do you want them to handle this? And we'll go with that person. If most of them will say, no, I don't have anybody. The only attorney I've ever had was for a traffic ticket, and I don't even remember his name or her name. And I'll say, okay, I can recommend some closing attorneys. And the same rule applies for me. I'm going to give them two or three, and I will say to them, you know, here's the email. You can reach out to them, ask them what they charge, get a feel for who you like the best, and just let me know. And I'll make sure to coordinate with whoever that is. Yeah. Okay. Um, Rose said, will there be a case where there's just a closing attorney for the seller and not the buyer? Well, I mean, if the buyer refuses to hire their own closing attorney, but that would be a, that would be a really dumb buyer, really dumb buyer. Because remember, it's the buyer who's taking all the risk at a closing. Once the property's changed hands, does anything really matter to the seller anymore? No. Liens don't matter. Things that don't get paid don't matter. It all matters to who after that? Buyer. A buyer. So to me, a buyer who chooses not to have representation in the form of an attorney at closing is really nuts. I've never seen it in my career. I've just never seen it. I'm assuming it's possible. The buyer wants to handle it themselves and do all that documentation themselves, but I don't even know what they would know what they're looking at. I mean, you think the buyer's going to know that the deed they just got is accurate? I wouldn't think so, unless they're attorney themselves, maybe. No. Um, Natalie, it is true. We were just having that discussion that the buyer dictates the closing attorney's office. Who chooses and who hires the closing attorney, folks? Buyer. The buyer, the buyer does. It's their attorney. So, of course, they're going to dictate. Yeah. It's their attorney. Right. It's their closing. It's not the seller's closing. Whose closing is it? The buyer. 
That's a buyer's day. That's a buyer's day. So the seller's just there to sign paperwork and get money, get out of everybody's face. Yeah. Uh, closing is a buyer's day. Yeah, I mean, I, and you really do have to look at it that way for a number of reasons as a real estate broker when it comes to sellers. Because inevitably, you're going to have sellers that will be like, well, I don't want to take down my wedding pictures for the showings. Why? Well, I like them. I know you like them. That's why you're going to take them with your ass. Put them in a box and tape them up so that you can take them with you. Because nobody else wants to see them. You're not cute now, and you weren't that cute back then either. Take them down. you got to have that mindset for a seller. It's not about them anymore. You know, you have people who say, well, I love that carpet. Yeah, but everybody else hates it. You're not living here anymore. You know, and th th so it's just fundamentally sellers need to just back off, especially about closing. I've had sellers say, well, that's not convenient for me. I don't care if they are my client. You know what I look at them and say? Nobody's asking you. They ain't asking you if it's convenient for you. You don't have to be there if you don't want to. In fact, the buyer would probably prefer that you're not there. That's another lesson. Buyers don't want sellers at closings. They don't want them there. You don't want them there either. Because you never know when a fight's going to break out over <laughs> some silly shit. Nothing, you know? Because you never know when the buyer's holding a grudge about how much they had to pay for the property or the seller's holding a grudge about some repair they had to make or something like that. And then it all boils over. I had an agent one time brought her seller to closing. I'm the buyer's agent. My buyers were had decided on this townhouse. They were very reluctant about a few things, one of which was the parking situation because it had a one-car garage. They were very reluctant about the parking. We had talked about it in detail. I had told them, you know, what the situation was. They had gone back and forth over it, and they finally said, you know what, it's in the perfect location. We can afford it. We'll just have to deal with the parking. We get to the closing, and the sellers are over there on the other side of the table going, now make sure you know what the deal is with parking because they'll sure tow the shit out of your car at this place. We haven't signed documents yet, you dumbass. Do you want to still be holding this house at the end of the day? I damn near broke that lady's toe under the table, and I'm not talking about the seller. Who do you think I'm talking about? <laughs> the broker? Their agent. <laughs> Their agent. And she looked at me, and she said, that hurt. I said, and it's going to hurt worse if you don't get their ass out of here right now. <laughs> Because this is not their show today. Nope. Get them out of here. You should not have brought them in. Well, they wanted to come. I don't give a shit what they want. I don't care. It's not their day. Whose day is it? And folks, this actually helps you on the test because you have to understand. As soon as you see, oh, we got to give this to a seller, what are you going to do with that as an answer choice? Eliminate it. Eliminate it. Nobody cares about sellers on the day of closing. Your time has come and gone. You are Queen Elizabeth. Bye. We loved you. It's over. Show's done. Nobody care about you today. It's just the way it is. I, I, I'm still sad about that. But it's the truth. The world moves on. It's the buyer's turn now. So one other big part of the Truth in Lending Act that you need to be aware of is something called Regulation Z of the Truth in Lending Act. Regulation Z requires that lenders fully disclose all of the terms of the loan to a borrower. Now, we know they do that with the loan estimate, right? So it seems like we've already taken care of that. But Regulation Z is actually about advertising. Do lenders advertise loans to try to get people to apply for them? Yes. 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 So Regulation Z is actually applying to lenders when you don't even uh, when you don't even apply for a loan when they're just doing what with a loan yeah. advertising advertising that they might give you a loan regulation z says that if a lender is advertising a specific loan not just that we'll give you loans we're going to talk about what makes it a specific loan here in a second but if you're advertising a specific loan then you have to be very specific about all of the terms of that loan now do you think this applies to advertisements to say, come to us for the best rates on a home loan? Do you think that applies to that advertisement? No. No, no. no. it's not specific enough. Does that make sense for everybody? Mm -hmm. 
How about an ad that says, come to us and get an $825 monthly mortgage payment? Uh -oh. yes. Yes. Bing, yes. Bing, 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 they bing. are advertising a very specific loan at that point. Does that make sense for everybody? Yes. So you now you got to tell the borrower, okay, well, how much do I, how much do I have to put down? How much am I borrowing? What are my monthly payments? Am I borrowing that money for fifteen years or thirty years? Or is everybody with me on that? Okay. Yes. So what then makes it a specific advertisement? And that is going to be something called a trigger term. A trigger term is something within the advertisement itself. It's almost like, y'all remember when we talked about first substantial contact? Mm -hmm. You remember how you could sit there and have a conversation with a buyer or a seller for 30 minutes and not have first substantial contact? Yep. But as soon as they give you very specific information about themselves, the ball game changes and you got to do the working with real estate agents, disclosure and disclose agency, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing is true here. Lenders can advertise, generally speaking, without doing these disclosures. But if the lender chooses to advertise specifically using a trigger term, then they have to now give the disclosures. Trigger terms, folks, are numbers in the advertisement that relate to the loan. Numbers in the advertisement that relate specifically to the loan. Now, Trigger terms are not bad. Don't choose that on the test. I'm going to repeat that. Please do not choose that on the test. Please do not choose an answer that says the point of regulation Z is so that borrowers won't see trigger terms. That is not the point of regulation Z. The point of regulation Z is not to tell lenders not to use trigger terms. The point of regulation Z is just to say, you've gone a little far now. You need to give some more detail. Is everybody okay with that statement? Okay, so what's going to put terms are not bad. They're not bad. There's nothing wrong with trigger terms. They're only bad if they're used alone without further disclosures. So examples of trigger terms are always going to have something in common. What do you notice is in all of these things? Numbers. 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 A number. Number about the loan. And it's a number about the loan. Payments as low as eight fifty a month. Is that a number? Mm -hmm. yes. And is it a number specifically related to the loan? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it is. Right? It absolutely is. 5% interest rate. It's a number and it's related to the loan. It's a trigger term. Everybody okay with that? Yes. Okay. So when we see trigger terms used like this, what we're saying is now the lender can't stop. You've given enough that you got to give the rest. Now, what's the rest of the story? What other things do you think the lender's going to have to do? I'm going to go back here because there, there are four bullet disclose. points there. Well, well, what things do we think we're going to have to disclose? The origination fee. The annual percentage rate, the finance charges, the amount of the payments, how many payments are going to be made. All of those things would now mean. And where would it need to be disclosed? On the note. In the ad or not the note. Remember, this is just an advertisement. Oh, the advertisement. Yeah. In the advertisement itself, we we'll now have to have those disclosures. You all have actually seen this law in play because this is not just apply to real estate. This is not like RESPA that applies just to real estate. This applies to any lending. Think of a certain type of commercial that you see on TV often where they focus on payments, where they focus on how much you would pay monthly if you bought this thing. And then at the end of the commercial, there's that big, long, with all the details. Um, yeah. Car advertisements. Why do you think they do all that at the end? They have to. They don't want you to have to. to According to what law? Truth and lending. Regulation Z of the Truth and Lending Act. And why do they have to do that? Because somewhere in that advertisement, they said one ninety nine a month, mm -hmm. eight hundred and seventy seven dollars down. You know, fifteen hundred dollar inception charge, which is the same thing as an origination fee, right? Does that make sense for everybody? Yeah. They've used trigger terms, so they got to give all the detail now. Is there anything wrong with them using trigger terms in the advertisement? 
No. 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 Does Regulation Z prevent them from using trigger terms in an advertisement? No. 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 Regulation Z just says because they have, they now have to go further. Don't take it too far, though. Watch this. Trigger term or not a trigger term? Not. No. no. Why not? Doesn't have anything to do with the loan. Doesn't have a single nothing to do with the loan. If you pay cash for the property, aren't you still gonna have to pay those HOA dues? Yep. Yes. Doesn't matter. Loan doesn't change it. Property taxes. That no. you see something like this, property taxes of thirty five hundred dollars a year. Trigger term or not? No. Nope. No, because you're going to have to pay property taxes whether you get a what? Cash or not. Or not. Or not. You pay cash, you still pay property taxes. And it's still going to be the same bill. You get a loan, you're still going to pay the same $3,500. Does that make sense for everybody? Mm -hmm. So it has to be not just any number. 2,800 square feet. Trigger term or no? No. no. Definitely not. Is the square footage the same whether you get a loan or not? It's only numbers that would change if you got a loan. And numbers that would change if you got a different loan. Would any of those numbers change if you got a different loan that's on that screen? Most likely, yeah. Yeah. And that's why you got to give full disclosures. Okay. It's got to be a number and that number has to be loan related. How do we feel about that for it to be a trigger term? Okay. And that's regulation Z of the Truth in Lending Act. The only number that a lender is allowed to use that is loan related, and it must specifically say this, is something called the APR. The APR is different than the interest rate. It's close, but it's different. Let me show you what I mean. You might see a loan that has a 6.25% interest rate. But if they tell you what the APR is, it would be 6.378459%. You always know when you're looking at an APR because it's got a shit ton of numbers behind a decimal. Mm -hmm. It's a very exact number. What do you think the APR includes that's not included in the interest rate up there? What do y'all think? Everything. All those fees. All those fees. The APR is meant to be an all-inclusive number. So in theory, if a lender gives you their APR, they are disclosing everything to you, right? So I, on the test, just be real careful. And you would always see the letters APR. That's how you're going to know to tell the difference. So if you see 6.25% interest, is that a trigger term? Yes. 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 And you got to do the other disclosures. If you see 6.387459% APR, what do you think? No, that's not. Not a trigger term. The idea here is it's all built into that number. It's sort of like that total cash to closing number on the closing disclosure. Everything's already part of it, so you don't need to be told anything else. Everything's already built into that number. I don't know that you see that on a test, but I just want to make sure you're aware of it. And other quick things that they require as a result of RESPA. RESPA requires us all to use the same forms. Remember I told you how this, the, no matter what lender you go to, they got to use the same forms. It's all standardized. That That is called the TRID forms. That's all you need to know about them. Just in case you see reference to it, they're not going to ask you questions about TRID forms. Just make sure you understand. If you see that, that's just part of RESPA. The forms that are required to be used and given to the borrower because remember, RESPA doesn't require anything to be given to who? To the seller. To the seller. Good. So the forms that are used and required to be given to the borrower are always called the TRID forms. Um, and, you know, it stands for TILA RESPA Integrated Disclosure, which you don't need to know. Here's what you do need to know about TRID forms, though. The most important of all the TRID forms is the closing disclosure. Why do you think that's the most important of all the forms? Because that's, that's the closing. That's the final one. It's the one. final one. This is it. It's over after this one, right? This is the last time to correct a mistake. This is the last time to give that borrower information. This is the end of the road. 
Please don't make the next thing I'm going to say harder than it is. I want everybody to like take a deep breath and sit back and go, I'm just going to take him at his word. I'm not going to make it harder than it is. And I'm not going to let my mind travel down 62,000 what if questions because I'm going to give you the answer to all your what if questions. Yes. Here's, that is the answer. Before you even ask him, the answer is yes. You ready for what I'm going to say now? You got your mind in the right space? Number one rule of the closing disclosure. Every dollar that has changed hands between the buyer and the seller will change hands between the borrower and the lender, will be paid to the real estate brokers, will be paid to the closing attorneys. Every fee, every commission, every sales price, every deposit, every dollar that that buyer has either paid or will borrow for the entirety of that transaction must be accounted for on what final document? Closing disclosure. Closing disclosure. What about a closing gift? And that too. Because a gift to them has what, folks? Monetary value. value. It has monetary value. If you're going to give them a gift, does the price, exact price of that gift have to show up on the closing disclosure to disclose to the lender that it is occurring? Yes. Yes. Better be a good gift. Yes. It absolutely does. Here's well, the thing, though. It's like a gift that somebody received and they didn't pay for it, and it's under a certain amount, like $25. And I don't care. Person- it better show up on that closing disclosure. And he's doing that to you on purpose because that's what they're going to do on the test. Now, is everybody going to follow this law? I am absolutely certain they do not. Let me ask y'all a question. Just theoretically now. You're somebody's buyer's agent. You buy them a bottle of wine two days after the closing. Have you committed loan fraud? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You have. So if my real estate broker did this, do I need to send them to jail? You do. Yes, please. That way there'll be fewer of us. Oh, wait a minute. Okay. Now, do you think people violate it all the time? Yes. Yes, they do. But for test taking purposes, you need to know. Anything that has any value that has changed hands at any time related to that transaction before closing, during closing, or even after closing, which is hard to predict, better beware. On the closing disclosure. On the closing disclosure. So if you're going to give them a bottle of wine a couple days after closing, when do you actually need to purchase it? Beforehand. Before it closes. Before closing so it can make it to what document? The closing disclosure. Closing disclosure. And if you're paying attention, how long before closing does the closing disclosure have to be finalized? Three days. days. Banking days. So you need to go buy your wine early. (laughs) And you need to get the receipt submitted to the closing attorney so that they can put the thing on the closing disclosure. Is it completely legal to give them a gift as long as you put it on the closing disclosure? Yes. 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 The law is not telling you don't give them a gift. The law is saying you must document it. And here's the reason. The lender, and I'm going to have to step away and let somebody in for just a second. It's time for acupuncture for Zelda. The lender has to be able to say no if it's too big of a gift. So I'm going to pause this for just a second, and I'm going to go let her in. I'll be right back, okay? So as I mentioned, and uh, thank you again for your patience. As I mentioned there, just put it on the closing disclosure. Make sure it gets on the closing disclosure and you'll be fine. Is it legal to buy your client a washer and dryer as a closing gift? Is that legal? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. As long as you put it where? In the closing disclosure. In the closing disclosure. Now, that does not mean the lender is going to allow you to do that. And that's the whole reason that we're required to put it there. There will be a point at which the lender will go, no, that's too much. That's too much. You can't, you can't do that because now you're essentially like bribing them to buy, to buy a house. So what I would say is, if you want to buy gifts for clients, um, number one, make sure you always do it before closing. Even if you don't give it to them after closing, that's fine. Um, but make sure you do it before closing. And number two, 
contact the lender and say, I'm thinking of this, will this be okay? So that they can basically look at all their numbers because it can throw off their like debt to income ratios and that kind of stuff. Um, so you, you really, uh, Jen said it seems poor taste to let people know how much it costs. Yes, but the federal law says they got to know. They got to know. So don't buy them no cheap closing gift because they're going to know how much you paid for it. Don't buy no two buck chuck and give it to them. They're going to know. Mine gave me ketchup and mustard and relish from Costco. Oh, and I've done like 10 transactions with him. No more. And he, he see still that I, you he, see that? and thinks you're his friend. He should have just given you nothing. That would have been better than ketchup and mustard and relish. It was like cheap what? brand. It was Heinz. It was not fancy. Like, did you get this from your pantry? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was surplus in the pantry. Yeah, you know, I was like, what'd you right. go to? What'd you go to? I mean, that's just yeah. crazy. I mean, at least some washing detergent or something. Like, <laughs> Amy said they had some repairs and and hers gave them Lowe's gift cards. Well, I hope they purchased them before the closing and put it on a closing disclosure. I think that's a great one. Absolutely. Uh, Alexa? What if they bring you a pie every Thanksgiving? So that is different. Um, okay. That is, that is considered a form of marketing that's not tied sure. to like that specific transaction. You know, we can do marketing that's not tied to a specific transaction. As a matter of fact, okay. I can buy gift cards and give them to all my former clients as a way of keeping in touch with them. And that doesn't need to be on a closing disclosure because okay. they're not. It, 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 it's when it's tied to that specific transaction. When I'm giving you something because of this one transaction, that's when that's when it gets regulated. OK, so they, they give you a giant thing of paper towels. It needs to be on there. If it's related, it's like, hey, congratulations on your closing. Right. I wanted to make sure you had paper towels. That should be on there because it's tied to the closing, right? But if they come and give everybody who they've ever done business with a $50 gaff, gas gift card as like uh, some kind of promotion that they're doing, that's just promoting. That's just marketing. And so okay. it's when it's specifically related to that transaction that it needs to be on there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and so this is a really great question. The other thing about um, RESPA is that we should never receive what they call kickbacks. Some of you are familiar with the terminology kickbacks. Some of you may be not familiar with the terminology kickbacks. <laughs> but we're going to talk about what a kickback is. A kickback is basically you, the broker, the licensee, receiving something of value because your clients spent money with somebody else. Not because you did, but because your clients spent money with them. For example, if your clients had a home inspection and the home inspector sends you a $10 Starbucks gift card as a thank you for sending your clients, that is an illegal kickback if the transaction involves a loan. Because RESPA says that you should not be recommend. Here's their fear. You're recommending the inspector that gives you the nicest shit versus the inspector that will do the best job for your client. You see how that would be a big fear in our business, right? The other one is, and this is happening more and more, and this is why this is so much more important. You're starting to see these one-stop shops. There are the Walmart versions of real estate now where you go into one office where it's a real estate brokerage, it's a title company, it's a homeowner's insurance company, it's a lender, and they're all in the same office. There's nothing illegal about that, folks. But let me tell you what is very illegal. Not letting that buyer know that they don't have to use all those services as a package. Not letting that buyer know that those are related to each other, that they are sharing money, that if you're spending money with one, some of it's going to the other. Does everybody make sense? Does that see, you see why that needs to be disclosed? Heck yes. Right? It, it, it is absolutely important that they recognize it is a conflict of interest. It is a conflict of interest because it is, here's the thing. What are the odds? I'm just going to throw this out there. Because some of you are going to be at these offices that have all these services, and it does make your life easy, but it'll also get you in trouble eventually if, you, if you're not careful. What are the odds that the best lender in town works at your office, and the best home inspector in town also works at your office, 
Oh, and the best appraiser in the area also works at your office. Oh, and the best contractor who do repairs also works at your office. That's a hell of an office. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The reality is that doesn't exist, folks. If you have a, a buyer, client, a borrower that's using all those services at your one office, there's nothing wrong with that as long as they're doing it with eyes wide open, knowing that they really aren't seeing all the options that they are choosing easy over maybe shopping it around is everybody good with that because yeah. when you're just doing the one-stop shopping you're kind of sacrificing the ability to shop around and so we need to make sure to disclose that um a relationship number one but also don't ever take anything of benefit from people who are other service providers in our industry i give you a personal example with me Keep in mind, the service providers are not going to know about this in a lot of cases. Some of them might, like lenders, but other ones won't. So you may have to send things back. Years ago when I bought this house, I'd been in the business for a few years. I had sent this one home inspector over the course of a couple years because I thought he was awesome and he was the best and I recommended him so heavily. I'd probably sent him 50 inspections in a two-year period. And he was relatively new in the business. And I had given his information to other agents because I was like, oh my God, this guy's great. He does a fantastic job. And, and Seth will tell you, he's still the best home inspector I've ever seen, even all these years later. He's unreal. He's, he's, he's so good that he's crazy about it. He's insane. He's OCD to the max. And they, he catches everything. <laughs> but I will use him. And, but I mean, he's the guy you want if you want to find everything. And but so he's really crazy. I was not recommending him because I wanted something of benefit. I was recommending him because he it was the best that I had found. To recommend does that make sense to everybody yes then when i bought my house i scheduled the inspection on my house mm -hmm. and he he came and he did the inspection he said who's the buyer because we would always you know on his file he knows i'm ordering the inspection but he's like who's the buyer and what's their information i'm like i'm the buyer he's like oh this is your house I'm like yeah this is the house we're buying he's like oh that's awesome congratulations two weeks later i hadn't seen an invoice and i said uh john I need the invoice. Why did I need the invoice? Where does it have to go? On what document? Closing disclosure. Closing, Closing disclosure, doesn't it? Isn't that money changing hands in the transaction? Mm -hmm. Right? I said, John, I need the invoice. He said, don't worry about it. I said, what do you mean don't worry about it? Why? I got to pay you. He's like, no, no, no. As much business as you send to me? Right there, folks. That's an illegal kickback. Yeah. You may think, oh, that's just a nice thing. No. He's not sending it to me because he's a nice guy. He's sending it to me as a direct relation to the fact that my clients have done what with him over the years? Use them, work with them. Use them, them work with him, spent money with him. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense for everybody? And that's what makes it illegal. Mm -hmm. If there's something wrong, he's going to find it, though. Now, here's the thing. Could John, and his last name is Martin, no, no, Cawthon. Okay. Um, could John come into our office? and buy lunch for everybody in the office, even the people who don't recommend him to their clients as a marketing activity. Could he do that? Yes. Because yes, yes, now lunch. it's not tied to the idea of he's doing it because I sent him business. Right. That, and that's the differentiation. That's kind of the question you were asking, I think earlier, Alexa, as well. You know, like a, if there's a difference between marketing and being something directly tied to the transaction. So Heather asked a little earlier, um, and I see where the train of thought is. It says the last bullet point seems to contradict what we just talked about on the previous slide. It says we can only give things to other licensees, but I thought we could give things to clients as long as it's on the closing disclosure. So yes. we, we may own, we can give them to the, but we're talking about receiving here. We're not talking about, we're not, not talking about the the giving at this point in time we covered that with the closing disclosure we're talking about us receiving things of value so licensees can only receive things of value from either their clients or other licensees like commissions right referral fees referral but, fees and that's what you have to think about because it only becomes a problem when the borrower is getting a loan and they're getting something of value it just it interferes with the numbers 
Um, I don't know how. So if you want to just take, them. if you just want to take that out, if that confuses you, it's more about the receiving of things of value. If you're a real estate broker and you're receiving something of value, it better be either from your client or from who? Another broker. Another broker. Another office, like a referral fee. Everybody, yeah. all right with that statement? If your home inspector is a licensee, still doesn't doesn't count, right? You well, they have to. They're wearing both hats. So, what are they giving right. you? For, what is that? What is the reason for the money in that case? Are they giving it to you because you sent them home inspections and it's still a violation? Yeah. You know? Getting the license doesn't change that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, so these are just some other laws that we talk about very minorly. The Equal Credit Opportunity Act basically says that lenders cannot discriminate in the granting of loans. This is a different law and you need to study it differently than the Federal Fair Housing Act. First of all, the Federal Fair Housing Act applies to what type of situations? When is it? When is the Federal Fair Housing Act apply? When is it not legal to discriminate according to the Fair, Federal Fair Housing Act? Residential. 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 But what's happening with residential real estate? Transactions. Okay, keep going. It's being what? It's being what? Sold. It's being sold or leased. That's when the Federal Fair Housing Act applies, when residential real estate is being sold or leased. The Federal Fair Housing Act has nothing to do with lending. Would it be a violation of the Federal Fair Housing Act to refuse to give somebody a loan based on their religion? Yes. No. Would no, it be no, a violation no. of the Federal Fair Housing Act to refuse to give somebody a loan based on their religion? No. Yes. Alone. When Fair does Fair the housing. Federal Fair Housing Act apply, folks? Buying or selling. Residential. Buying or selling and leasing. Did I say anything about the house being bought or sold or leased and not what I asked you? No. So let me repeat the question. Would it be a violation of the Federal Fair Housing Act to refuse to give someone a loan based on their religion? No. 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 You've got to commit to that. Again, remember what those discrimination questions, remember what I told you you're going to do? You're going to answer from here rather than here. Fresh corn. But fresh corn doesn't apply to giving a what, Natalie? Um, a loan. Because fresh corn only applies to residential sales and leases. Everybody okay with that? It'd be a different story if you had said something along the lines of would it be a federal would it be a violation of the Federal Fair Housing Act to <laughs> refuse someone's offer based on their religion. That's different because now you're preventing them from buying or selling based on their religion, and that would be a violation of the Federal Fair Housing Act. I didn't ask if it would be a violation of any law to give uh, to not give a loan based on somebody's religion, because that would be a different answer. It is a violation of a law. You've got to know which one. You can't just sit there and go, that's racist. That's illegal. That will fail you on this test. There are different laws for different situations. What law applies to the giving of loans, folks? The Equal Credit Opportunity Act. So, quick question. Would it be a violation of the Federal Fair Housing Act to refuse to give somebody a loan based on their religion? No. 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 Would it be a violation of the Equal Credit Opportunity Act to refuse to give someone a loan based on their religion? Yes. 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 Do you see the difference? Yes. Okay. When you read those questions, you have to really compartmentalize. You have to Would say, it, okay, they're asking about this loan, but it's this situation. Would it be a violation of the Equal Credit Opportunity Act to refuse to rent a home to someone because they are female? No. 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 Why not? It's sex is on the list. The law doesn't apply. The law that I ask about doesn't apply to renting, right? Mm -hmm. Would it be a violation of the Federal Fair Housing Act to refuse to rent a home to someone because they're female? Yeah. Yes. Yes. You see the difference, right? So this law applies when loans are involved. It, this law does not apply to us as brokers. Who does this law apply to? Lenders. 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 Remember how we talked about the Federal Fair Housing Act only applies to brokers and 
sellers and, and brokers and landlords, right? Lenders are not on that list. This is the law that applies to landlords. This is the, I mean, not, shh, I can't talk to you. Lenders. lenders. This is the law that applies to lenders. This law right here, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. It also has a different set of protected groups. Not very different, but slightly different. And some of you, based on questions you have emailed me, need to pay attention to this list. Familial status, which is on the Federal Fair Housing Act. What does familial status have to do with marriage? Nothing. 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 Okay. Nothing. What does familiar status have to do with whether you got a got a honey bun that lives with you? It doesn't. It doesn't. What does familiar status have to do with? Kids. Kids. Children. Children. Yes. Children. Children only. So would it be a violation of the Federal Fair Housing Act to refuse to sell a home to someone because they are single? No. No. Would it be a violation of the Federal Fair Housing Act to refuse to sell a home to someone because they are single? No. 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 Because there's nothing in the Federal Fair Housing Act about what? Marital, marital, marital status. status. Uh, look at this list. Is it illegal according to the Equal Credit Opportunity Act to refuse a loan to someone because they are single? Yes. 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 Do you see the difference? Mm -hmm. yes. True or false? It would be a violation of the Federal Fair Housing Act to refuse to rent a apartment, a third floor apartment to uh, an elderly man because of his age. True false. or false? False. 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 Why not? Rent. Age. Age. Not age, age is not a protected class under the Federal Fair Housing Act. Correct? Correct. Correct. True or false? It would be a violation of the Equal Credit Opportunity Act to refuse to grant a loan to someone because of their age. Yes. Yes. True. True. yes. Yes. Folks, I don't care if they're 87. They want a 30 year fixed rate mortgage. You give it to them. Ernest, do you think they're going to put something tricky like that on their test? Yes. Uh, okay. They will throw those laws in a blender and whir them together because here's what they know you do. Oh, that's illegal. That's illegal. That's illegal. Yeah. But according so to which what? law? Based on which law in which situation? Are you going to have to go back and look at those and make sure you got the laws sorted out with the situations they apply to? Yeah. Yes. That's those are the ones I would take a hot second on. I'd be like, all yeah. right, this law. Yes, that is, that is tough to tease out. It really is. You got to make sure you do that because that's the way all those questions are going to be. They're mm -hmm. going to give you four illegal things, but only one of them is going to be illegal until, according to that one law. You know, that, that's, that's how they're going to hit you with that. Um, just a vocabulary word you need to be aware of, something called usury. I think of it as loan sharking. Um, usury laws are laws that are designed to prevent lenders uh, from uh, charging excessive interest rates. Now, the, right. we can debate what is excessive or not, but every state has a different level um, for usury charges, the maximum possible usury charges. Um, and it basically... Um, it is an individually set um, number, and lenders cannot go higher than that. Does that make sense for everybody as far as a definition goes? Yes. It basically is a law in the state that says you cannot charge more than this. If you do, then you are committing the crime of usury. The current one in North Carolina, by the way, for mortgage loans is 16%, just so you know. I don't think we're going to hit that number anytime soon. That's the, that's the current maximum under North Carolina state law for, for a mortgage note, 16%. That's an ugly number. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's a real ugly number. <laughs> Uh, the Fair Credit Reporting Act gives individuals the right to check their own credit report at least once per year for free from each of the three credit bureaus. So you do not have to pay to see a copy of your credit check uh, at least once per year from the three bureaus. Um, make sure you know the definition of loan fraud. And I've given you some examples that you can look at when you go through your studies. But really, it's just a definitional thing. Loan fraud is 
filling out a loan application with any incorrect information or failing to provide a lender with information that should be provided to the lender. So remember what we say it was when you don't give the lender the receipt for the bottle of wine that you you, you paid for for your client. Loan fraud. It's oh, loan my. fraud. It's loan fraud. And the potential penalty for loan fraud is a million dollar fine and 30 years in prison. So I would suggest you probably follow that. Yeah. Now, obviously, I don't think anybody's ever been to prison for giving a bottle of wine. What, have, what we have gone to prison for as real estate brokers are things like my investor client just got an FHA loan. You will go to jail. You will. The borrower might too, but you will. For sure. What are you supposed to know about FHA loans? You have to or reside in the home. Or an occupancy. Yeah. Here's the thing. You know there's no way they miss that at the lender. If you know that person that you got as a client is an investor, and you know they're getting an FHA loan, you know they did what on that application? Lied. Lied. They lied. lied. It's the only way it got approved. It's your job to point it out to the lender. They lied. There's no way. They're an investor, right? So make sure you understand it is important that lenders get accurate information at all times um, in deciding whether to give these loans or not. And that is it, folks, for financing. How about that?